Some of them the Kukapa tribe, who was a tribe from the Colorado River area in our region, and in Mexico, when they put the wall up, it separated uh, in Southern California a lot of the Indian tribes. It's, it's from San Diego, uh, the mountain area separated the Kumeyaays, and then in, in Arizona along the Colorado River, it separated the Kukapas and the Kokapas. So, us and our ancestry, because we're all Mexican Americans, we're all now maybe, I don't know, born in the USA, born in the USA, born in Mexico, huh? naturally citizen. So, the, the, the phenomenon that we have in our region is that the Colorado River gave us life, and because of climate change, and because of, because of drought, the Colorado River is giving us death. We're going to try to explain that a little bit today. Um, there's a lot of information most recently on the Colorado, on YouTube, and on the internet. There's a lot of uh, interest. There's a lot of worldwide uh, filming and photography that's being done. Uh, I myself work with uh, a gentleman from Turkey based in New York, and he did a production called The Colorado. And another guy from Germany is doing something called Land Rush that's showing the devastation caused by so many acres of water in the Colorado. So, the Colorado River, before it was tamed, ran all the way to the Sea of Cortez. How many of you are familiar with the Sea of Cortez? So, the Colorado River, starting way up here in the Rocky Mountains, runs to seven states and it used to empty out right there. It used to empty in the Sea of Cortez, so Mexican border is right there. And the Colorado River makes its way and feeds uh, fresh water to all that area. And of course it used to snow more and rain more in the whole region, so there was a lot of aquifers and a lot of wells and all that. But because of climate change and drought, the stress on the river is now causing a lot of uh, a lot of uh, disasters, especially for us on both sides of the border. We'll get into that a little bit more. But right now, we just want to talk a little bit about the history about the river. And uh, if anyone has any questions about the history about the river, we can, we can go into that just for about five minutes, five or ten minutes. So we're going to talk about the history, we have to give us a, a little bit of your take on the history of the river in our region of Mexico. Well, I can add a little bit to that history. Um, so we're living in Imperial County, close to the Mexican border. Uh, it's, uh, it's in this area right here, right at the lowest point for the Colorado River. So we have, in our community, uh, we have the biggest allotment of Colorado. The, the, the Water Power Agency has the biggest allotment of the, the water, the Colorado River allotment in that area. Uh, back in the 1900s, there was flooding, and the agency thought, well, you know what, we can divert water and create a new community out here uh, in Imperial County, create an agricultural community somewhat, you know. So that happened in maybe the 1900s, around the 1900s. And, and now in the middle of the desert, you have this big land of this, uh, that produces the agriculture for worldwide export. You know, corporate America, right? That's, that's sent across the state. Uh, just like any community, we are a food desert. And this, this food is also not accessible to our community, even though we produce that the biggest, um, we had the biggest agricultural commodities in, in that area. Um, so that's a little bit of the history of uh, the agriculture, how farmers, how settlers took advantage of the Colorado River, uh, the flow of the Colorado River, and tried to create a, a, a lake also. This is called the Salton Sea. And this is it right here, this little picture here. So this is the largest lake in California. Um, it's so, you know, history says it's a man-made lake, 
but water, you can't control water. You know, water is going to flow whichever way it wants to flow. Whether you create a, a new river or a new channel for it, it's going to flow through there and it's going to cross problems, right? If it overflows. And that's what happened in our community. So they started the, they started creating a, a, a dam, created canals to divert water. Then there was a flooding a few years later, which just flooded the whole area. So now the Salton Sea remains there. But now, now in 2000, 2000 now we're in 2018, um, there's a lot of environmental issues happening associated with the, that water that's been um, influent water in, that has been positive into the Salton Sea. Um, and, and a lot of this has to do with climate change. In 2003, uh, there was a water transfer to the urban cities, wanting more water from uh, this, this region, which is a low income community. Uh, it, uh, it's a primarily low income uh, Latino, uh, Spanish speaking community. Uh, there was a water transfer to the urban cities because there was a need for for water to the urban cities, right? Uh, more affluent, needed water, so we got they diverted water. What's happened in this area? It's been agriculture for over a hundred years. Uh, this lake, this so-called man-made lake called the Salton Sea, has uh, what's been discharged into the lake has been fertilizers, pesticides, industrial waste from Mexico. Because we are in close proximity to Mexico, there's a river called the Blue River that goes north into California. Uh, so the Salton Sea has all these all, all this sediment, fertilizer, like I mentioned, um, industry waste, household waste. And now, in 2003, for these transfers until now, it's been receding very rapidly, creating a, a, an environmental disaster for our community. Uh, these, these toxins are becoming airborne. Uh, we have also one of the highest incidents of asthma in, in, in Imperial County. So all these factors are now uh, climate change, uh, impacting our community, uh, their health, the kids, the respiratory issues in, in our community. So these are some of the, the issues that are happening there. We're just going to give a quick overview and we can give you questions. And, and so that's just a little bit of just so we can get to speed on what we're going to do. Can you say a few words the history of this area, the people who live in this area, especially the Mexican-Americans? Just ask him if he has something he wants to add in regards to the history of the area. Primeramente, algunas de las cosas ya las acaban de mencionar ellos. Some of the things that are already mentioned, pero no recuerdo si dijeron el río Colorado comienza precisamente en el estado de Colorado. So the river starts up in the state of Colorado. Baja hacia el sur, llega al estado de Colorado parte de Colorado, llega Arizona, este, parte de Nevada de y desemboca California, por supuesto California, Arizona y desemboca en el en el Delta, que es en los límites eh, en el estado en el Mar de Cortés o el Golfo de California. Uh, Antiguamente había bastante agua, la agricultura no estaba tan desarrollada. There used to be a lot of water because agriculture wasn't as, as it developed in the region, even though it emptied all the way into Sea of Cortez in Mexico. Había bastante agua y este, se alcanzaba a inundar algunas partes de, del sur de lo que era el delta del río Colorado. So in the delta region down here in the river, there was a lot of water that accumulated the runoff all the way from the top all the way to the bottom. De, dentro de esas uh, partes que estaban, cuando venían las temporadas de lluvia para el norte, venían las crecidas de agua y se inundaba lo que era, en el lado mexicano, lo que era el mayor, eh, el indivisuo, with, with the seasonal rains and the snow, of course, the, the, the sea would rise, the, the uh, river would rise, and the more water would flow into this region with, with the seasonal changes. There's a lot of water up in that In aquel tiempo, este, pues, uh, no estaba tan explotada la pesca, y pues, uh, llegaban al delta del Colorado, había 
tortugas enormes, había uh, la vaquita marina que últimamente ha salido mucho a la luz porque está a punto de, de la extinción. Uh, well, había, even, even during that period, with the waters receding and rising, there was a lot of, there was a very rich fishing, uh, fishing operations going on in this region with, with, with the fresh water and the sea water mixed and, and the tides had been and no, that's no longer the case. Uh, para para aventajar un poco, no ser muy tedioso, este, la agricultura se desarrolló primeramente en, en Baja California, lo que es el, el área de lo que es Mexicali y San Luis, lo que era el sur, este, antes que, que en Estados Unidos, porque uh, las uh, el terreno era más propicio para salir, llegar el agua hasta esos terrenos. En aquel tiempo estaba una compañía, el Colorado River, una compañía estadounidense, que comenzó a explotar esos tierras. During that time, agriculture started more in the Mexico side. There was, a, there was a company called the Colorado River Land Company that started developing uh, agriculture in that region before it got bigger in the United States section. Se extendió hacia el norte. Uh, es, como les decía, este, este, los terrenos eran más fáciles porque era el final del desierto. Hacia el norte, en el, lo que pertenece a Estados Unidos, era el desierto. Y era más difícil en aquel tiempo este, abrir, abrir los, los canales para, para cruzar el agua. Entonces, llegaba por México y luego cruzaba hacia Estados Unidos. So, it was all desert area and it wasn't developed yet with irrigation systems that are now in place on both sides of the border. So, when the, when the natural flow of the water came, it was much more level on the Mexican side of the border. So, that's one of the reasons why uh, agriculture developed first uh, in, in the Mexican side of the border rather than It's now the biggest United States part of the Federal In that time, the sur was not so populated. So, they brought people from the Chino to the Baja California, north of Baja California. And this area being the most northern part of Mexico, Mexico of course being down here, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of labor there. So the first uh, people that came uh, as, as immigrants that they brought in to do the farm work and the hard labor were Chinese immigrants that they brought in into the community there uh, during that early periods of the, of the irrigation. The principal este, agricultura era el algodón. Que fue, Paco was big in the region, real big. Que fue una de las fuentes que floreció más, este, tuvo mucha demanda. Aparte de eso, que el valle era propicio para ese tipo de, de, de agricultura, donde inclusive uh, posteriormente, uh, el, pues ya por los años 40, finales de los 30, 40, que ya floreció mucho los valles, hubo mucha agricultura, hubo bastante auge. Inclusive, personas de origen blanco de Estados Unidos iban a trabajar a los campos de, del Valle de, de, de Mexicali, lo que es ahora mismo. During the 30s and the 40s, there was a lot of uh, American companies that started working and, and producing and investing in the Mexican side during the 30s and the 40s. Big business started to, started to flourish in that region. Posteriormente, uh, o casi Calmeral, que, que, que había bastante agua, vinieron, uh, comenzaron a, a canalizar el, lo que es ahora el Canal América, en, que cruza del río Colorado, cruza todo el desierto y, y llega al Valle Imperial. Entonces, they, they developed then a very sophisticated irrigation system uh, through the damming of uh, a 
of the Colorado River, Hoover Dam, and then down in Imperial County, they build the All American Canal, and then they build this very sophisticated irrigation system on both sides of the port. And and uh, and that's what for the last hundred years still exists. So ahí vamos a parar la historia y vamos a hablar de la riqueza. So, so then, this is the sophisticated irrigation system after the Hoover Dam. You know, it was a wonder of the, a wonder of the world at that time, and again, you can see a lot of YouTube and fields about how that was done. But the Imperial Irrigation District, where we're from, controls three drops of water of I.B. four to cross that. And with the price of water, the value of water today, those farmers still pay $20 an acre foot for that water when California's average is around 70, we sell about 1,000, and if you clean it up and put it in a little bottle, it's about 24 million. So, you know, what's, what's happening? What's happening? What, what is this leaving us that, that been living there for five or six generations. Because the same farmers and companies that started this um, and utilized Mexican labor, the Bracero program, the, you know, the H2 program, and then the migrant workers, and the stream there, it, it, continues, it, it continues to be the same. But you got a hundred years of it. Insecticides, pesticides, herbicides, DDT before they banned it, uh, uh, what is it, bromide, uh, excuse me? You're right, and, uh, and, and, and all these things that, that are in the water, well, where does it go? Okay, we're in a, an area called the, the salt and sink because your, your elevation from Rocky Mountains down to sea level, and in Imperial County it's about 175 foot drop. And then you have a valley that goes north that goes another 235 foot drop with no outlet. So that creates a cesspool and a sump that we live in around, with no one assuming any responsibility. And then what happens with California? Grows to uh, when California grows to 40 million people, and we have the drought, then they say we need to put it back on the, I guess on the, uh, on the ground. Then we need water. So then they tell the Imperial Valley, well, you got a lot of water from the three drops out of every four. Sell us some. Yeah, but what's going to happen to the salt sea? Oh, but well, we're going to give you good money for it. Well, sell us something for, 40, for 40, 45 years. And then in the, in the next five years, we'll give you an option to sell it some more for 35 years. How much are you going to give it? Well, I'll tell you what, we'll give you about $650 an acre foot for your 20. Farmer said, hell, I won't grow that. You give me 165 or 100, yeah, for, for not using that 20 bucks and, and you sell it for 600, well, I'll make money. And I think they're at about 285 this year. And they say, well, we need to make some water available. So they did uh, some canal and efficiency lining, the cement lining of, 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 of the first. Oh. I just had a quick question. So, how much work are you doing with community in Mexico? You know, given that this. You know what, what's happening in Mexico is that the government is trying to control that. And so the government in Mexico has is, is, is been so corrupt that if it's not something that's going to benefit them in government, then they really don't go out of their way to benefit the community as a whole. But that might change a little bit. But yet, there are structures that are set up to meet and do something, but, but they really don't go the extra mile. They don't, they don't, they're supposed to. They have a financial committee for this, and a financial committee for 
And are there similar like communities on the other side of the border? Yeah, but they're not they're not strong at all because the government doesn't support that type of, of work in Mexico yet. They, they might be a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> so I'll let that go into is to what's being done in the community. And as you can see, that's the other slide on the uh, on, on the income. So they can just get an idea of, of what the income is. There was a there was a chart there. So I'll go ahead and get started. So you know, based on all these, everything that John mentioned. Let me just finish with this one. Yeah. Okay. So I go back to 1967 because I can relate to my 69 years in the area, and I can relate to you know my 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 parents coming to the area in the early early turn of the century, and my grandma being born in the 1800s. And I see this, and I go. Value of 66, 67 of asparagus, you know, million dollars, cantaloupe, you know, eight million, lettuce, twenty-five million, and they cry every year all the way to the bank. So let's look at what it is last year. You know, they can take a, a head of lettuce now and chop it up and not waste it. Run a little piece of it. Let's just put it in an eight ounce bag and sell it to you for 99 cents. And they're making four or five bucks right off on that one lettuce. And you put it in a box of 50, five times 50 is how much? 250. A couple hundred bucks, right? And it still costs them only about four bucks to produce it. So it's not only, so. Two point five billion dollars. Yes, uh, last year. And then you aggregate, then you compound that on what the impacts are on the ancillary employment to the industry, which is another two billion. So it's four point five or so. And these guys, like I said, are crying all the way to the bank. But we have the highest unemployment rate still over these hundred years. We hover at about 18 to 20. National average, right? What is it? Well, but then we put it in, whatever they tell us. Four or five or something. Our, our uh, educational system, we only still have one extension of San Diego State in our community for 100 years. Across the board, at the same time, have about 25 institutions of higher education putting out doctors, lawyers, engineers, scientists, you name it. You know, but we're still on this side having an exit to find opportunity. You know, our family and friends, all my brothers and sisters left. The biggest industry is cattle. And you know what cattle is? What are you talking about? What kind of cattle? Beef, beef, the range, what do you call it? Kaifo, what do you call it? Kaifo, the right animal feeding operation. Oh, okay, Kaifo. They have over 30 facilities. That's right. Close to 400,000. Methane, bark, and crap. And dust. And we, M10. And, and we have, they surround us, they surround us. So we have these days of inversion, and we have these days of smell. And they set up a slaughterhouse, and we breed this, and we did this, and they don't want to hear it. They're starting to sabotage our meetings now because they don't want to hear it. But like I said, we don't. You know, we're we're not a pushover, but yet we have to know what we're doing because they've been able to maintain this strong control for over hundred years. So. Um, uh, that's all I didn't go to I just had another, I think you raised a really interesting point, which is, I don't know if it was mentioned yet, but most of what's being grown there is grass to feed cattle in other countries, so it's shipped. It's not really a vegetable economy anymore, it's grass that's being shipped out because other countries like Saudi Arabia, 
they don't have the water to grow such water-intensive, low-value crops. So in essence, the whole animal economy is subsidized by this very cheap water in this one area. Right. We've had attempts to come into our region and purchase water rights. You know, the, 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 they've sued the Florida Supreme Court. They say that the prairie has present perfected rights and perpetuity in the water that pertains to the land. So a farmer can use all the water he wants for his land. And they've never had a shortage of water in 100 years. But across the board in Mexico, there's no really control. And now, the farmers are back on the other side of the border, selling their products for the same prices they can get on this side of the border, but using the cheaper water on that side of the border and the cheaper labor on that side of the border, on the Mexican side of the border. And so the, the, the Mexican farmers are being squeezed uh, by American agribusiness also. Again, that, that's going to change. They're going to, they're going to, this new president coming in is going to redo all of that because um, there's, there's fights over that, all that water. How can they sell their water rights? It, it was going to control it. It should be just like the U.S. The, the Mexicans want government people for the people, by the people. And when you got these beer plants like Constellation Brands, as an office here, that is setting up a beer plant where the agribusiness guys, small farmers, where the small farmers in Mexico, as opposed to big business in the U.S., can't even get enough water to water their crops and grow them. This beer plant is, is going to use all the water they want to produce beer. A $2 billion bottling, beer bottling operation, all for export of Corona, Modelo, and, 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 and those brands that are Anheuser-Busch. Uh, funded uh, operation. So there's a big fight going on. One of the guys who's supposed to be here was the guy leading that fight. But the, the, the government put a hold on his visa so he can't cross the border. He can't cross the border because he's giving them, he's giving them hell. He's showing them, they're exposing the corruption. And then the other guy from the, the Kuka Pai, the leader of the Kuka Pai tribe, was a young guy and he had a family emergency so he couldn't be here. And he was going to tell us how. The Kukupa Indians, who still control about 70, 700,000 hectares of land, don't have any water. So they can't do anything with their land. But this new president says, the indigenous people, the Indians, you're going to be at the table. Anything going on in your states, in your communities, you're going to be at the table so that you also benefit from any uh, transformation that's going to happen. Okay, so that's good news. I hope your new president's health. We say so. So it's good news, but again, there's big business and influence worldwide that's putting pressure on him, and we don't know how far he's going to get uh, on that. So what's what's happening is that organizations like the one he founded, that now his son runs, who is perfect English speaking understands the politics, understands the government, understands the science, makes the contracts with the universities, has created linkages and, and, and collaborations, and not afraid you know, to speak truth to power, as they say, are making inroads, now has, has a bigger staff, people with policy, get the works on policy, uh, uh, Sacramento, and now we have a guy in Sacramento now, working goes with the government, because some of these have to be institutional changes to change attitudes and behavior because they won't do it voluntarily. So some of these uh, laws uh, have to be changed. And who's leading the charge some of those laws? Well, some of the guys that look like us and talk like us and still have family and friends on both sides of the border, as we do. And I, was in, I, was in, I was in Mexico yesterday, but I was born and raised and lived in the United States. I have you know, the right to be anywhere in the world based on my U.S. citizenship and anywhere in the world based on my Mexican uh, ancestry and residency. And what we're wanting is a, is a better quality of life for 
for everyone, uh, including my, you know, my great great grandkids. And let me tell you, let me tell you a story. I saw this agribusiness guy yelling at my father when I was a little kid. But yet, my granddaughter's great grandfather happened to be the president of the department. So I see the attitudes change. I see still. There's the majority that push the back box that don't want us to interfere with their, with their profit, with their bottom line, you know, with, their, with, their, with their bank accounts. They keep them going. So I'll shut up. Did you want to share something? Uh, well, just in, in regards of what we do at the organization, um, we try to share as much as we can all this information with the community. Um, in regards to the song and see, we do have a campaign. It's an educational campaign. It uh, just tries to inform the community what is that's going on. A little bit of the history of the song and see. A lot of them, you will be surprised that they don't even know it exists, even though they live like 20 miles away from it. So you have to, that's one of our mission, like one of our uh, goals to be out there in the community, let them know that this is what's going on, this is that you need to be informed. This is uh, this particles of being part of the air. You being breathing in and out uh, can be a reason for your son to have asthma, so you have to be part of it. So that, that's uh, one approach that we can try to just educate the community, inform them uh, what is it that's going on, and um, we encourage them to to keep track of, of progress of anything that the state does. If there's policy being implemented so they can stay up to date and if there's anything that they want to advocate for or even be part of us and go to Sacramento and be in front of the um, to the, in front of the boards and just let, let them know about our history what is it that we're facing uh, that's one part of what we do um, it, the, the, there's a website if you guys want to see it later it's uh, uh, south of c c o e e dot o r g if you guys want to visit that later it's pretty much an informational website and uh, there's also, if you want to uh, you talk about our flag program, which, uh, yeah. C O E. Uh, Solid C. C, like Charlie, O like Oscar, E like Echo, E like Echo. S A L T O N C S E. Solid C. S E A. S E A, I'm sorry. S E A. Then more. Another thing that's. Uh, the veto of what you talk about is the innovation regarding our concern with the particular matter that we're breathing in our community and what your organization has done and has been the leader, not only in, in our community, but across the state and the country in implementing what you talk about. So based on all the concerns that John mentioned on air quality, the pollution sources in the Salton Sea, for transport of Good movements that happen in our community from freight, good movement to the ports of uh, international ports to Mexico, to the ports of Long Beach, come to our communities, the like agriculture, the methane sources, uh, hazardous waste facilities that are, we live in the whole state of California, and we have one of those. And these, these facilities are, are purposely located in environmental justice communities. One's in Bunny Willow, one's in Kettleman City, or in Kettleman City, and one's in Pearl County. So we have all these multiple sources of pollution and cross-border pollution from toxic facilities as well. And the agriculture also most a lot of uh, greenhouse gases and a lot of different uh, uh, contaminants. So our community, as, as John mentioned, is from a less founded organization back in the 80s over farm worker justice and immigrant rights. Now in 2000, we moved them more towards uh, Social more to uh, research, to action projects, more on pesticide awareness, asthma studies, air quality issues. Um, so we, in, in 2014, we, we got a grant with uh, NHS, which is the National Institution of Environmental Health Sciences, to implement a community air monitoring network that will give you real-time data um, based on the community concerns. So this project was established in 2014. We had community. The whole project was guided by community members with concerns of what their quality was, where would they want to see monitors located because it's, I don't know, maybe you're familiar with our air districts are pro-industry. You know, the area districts don't, are not here to protect the health of the most vulnerable in our communities. 
people in our community, whether it's the oil industry or agriculture, yeah, these are led by industry movements, pretty much. That's why everybody's in this area this week, right? It's calling out the government of Brown for, uh, for what's happening, right? For not holding, for allowing this to continue, right? The fossil fuels. And it's all connection. Fossil fuel, whether it starts for the oil extraction, it comes out of that tailpipe and that farm truck out in Imperial County. It doesn't matter. It's a, it's a whole connection. So, based on all these concerns, um, our community, you know, had for many years had wanted the more and more air modeling data because we, for a, a region that spans over 4,000 miles, 4,000 square miles, uh, there was only five regulatory monitors. But this data was never uh, accessible to the community. It wasn't in a way that is accessible where they can easily understand it or they can easily be part of the discussion when their district is, is pretty much having, leading the discussion with industry and not the community. So we developed this project. Um, we located 40 air, air monitor sensors throughout Imperial County for particular matter, uh, PM 2.5 and PM 10. And the locations that were based were the first 20 monitors were based on community concerns, but also with science, uh, good science, scientific methods, uh, like the, and the second 20 monitors were based on land use regression models based on the data that we had already, uh, the data that we had already. Uh, Collected based on the, on the community air monitoring network, the initial 20. So, this, this monitoring network, I'm going to be brief because I'm going to be a bit but I want to get into where we're at now with this monitoring network because it, it, it has allowed our organization in the last four years to really uh, create transform, transformational changes, I can say, across not just in our community, but across the state and across the nation, and has given us a lot of. Um, being recognized as a leader of innovative, innovative science projects in our community. So, so we have this modern network that now the California Air Resources Board, which is the lead agency of air quality, is looking at looking at it as a model for for the whole state of California. Because yes, yes. when you say looking at it as a model, the model as far as remediation, or just a model as far as acquiring data. Uh, a model as acquiring the data. That communities haven't had for decades and decades. That's the data that, that is new. Yeah. yeah, so this, this data is now being so this data is also it's now being used, you know, uh, in schools to to uh, to reduce exposure to kids uh, and asthma, changing policies in school, also changing policy at the at the local level and at the state level, because the model that I was getting at the, the model now is being Last year was a law implemented at AP 617, and our model here is being repl replicated throughout the state of California. And now that is one that is being replicated to the state of California, we want to look at other contaminants, methane, uh, toxic, toxic contaminants as well. So this next year we're, we're focusing on looking at methane from moss sources through partners throughout California and the environmental justice movements. If you're familiar with the California environmental justice movements, there's many partners there from the Central Valley to the Bay Area, uh, in Imperial County, and even in urban settings in Wilmington. Yes. Well, I mean, I'm not saying nothing is a serious problem, but uh, historically, and I'm talking about in terms of Earth history, as long as Earth has been here, methane has biologically been handled by all of us, the bacteria. So what I'm really concerned about, I think it needs to be concerned about, is those biotoxins, neurotoxins, and all of those things that have just been created by mankind in the last couple of, well, mostly in the last 50 years, but in the last 150 years, those are the toxins that are hurting your children and hurting your grandchildren and going to hurt the next five generations. And there's a lot of problems with it, but Pretty tame compared to yes. others. And I've said that. You know, we understand that as a community organization, we understand we know that methane is, is not a public health toxin, you know, but and it can come from many sources, it can come from landfill, it can come from the salt right. of sea, it can come from geothermal, it can come from natural gas plants, leaves. We, we know that, but it's also in, in uh, uh, communities where they have refineries, they've been able to identify other contaminants associated with with uh, exceedances of methane and be able to, to look at other topics, right? So we developed, so based on this, this implementation of this policy 8617, we decided, okay, 
do a model for a PM 2.5, PM 10, we have that model done. What's the next step? So it's like a science project, you know, how do we move forward when the state of California hasn't done much research around methane? You know, they don't have much stuff around methane anyhow. So we developed these strategies statewide with partners in the environment of Mexico, which is do methane from off sources. And believe me, we're getting a lot of pushback from these methane emitters. These industry, we're getting a lot of pushback in the past couple of weeks, the past couple of months. They have been showing up to our meeting, disrupting our meeting. So it's, you know, but we got to start somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we know that methane is, you could find indicators of other contaminants with methane. Yeah. So when you're looking at the methane, are you looking at the, like, cow, the cow stuff as well? Well, in Imperial County, it's primarily feedlots and mm -hmm. animal feeding operations. In the, bay, in the Central Valley, they have dairy farms, but they also have oil and gas in Imperial County. So we we're looking at, at it from every lens. I think, you know, it is, so this is like a new project. You know, we're going to do the PM 2.5 and on this add a layer of methane. We don't know what it's going to look like yet, but this is all part of innovating, right? Part of innovating to making sure that this data is available. For, for community and for government to use it, where things are happening in real time, where people live, breathe, and play, right? So, so as, as the question is, you know, we're looking at in Imperial County, we, I think that's what we want to look at, at around there, uh, feedlots, right? But, you know, we don't know what it's really going to look like yet. We still got to gather that information, but we also um, plan on adding other toxic criteria pollutants and Next, maybe next year, because with this implementation of AB 617, what happens is it gives us an opportunity to look at other toxics. But we thought, you know, how do we push the state to act now instead of saying, how do you know? So we had to develop a plan, we to do methane. And after methane, we're going to look at just directly benzene or toluene or any well, of the other contaminants, right? Which, uh, the uh, Urea, uh, since it's mostly feedlot, you have a lot of antibiotics that are being discharged by the cattle and uh, you're having a lot of hormones being discharged and then they're excreted and, and dried and blown and all of that stuff. We have, right? exactly. we have, we have sheep. Increases. We have sheep also. A large number well, of sheep are for export. And are they see, not fine out? Yeah, they're not fine in the alfalfa fields. Well, that's and they need a dump and they need a dump and they need a dump and then I see that same field uh, with the sign on it organic in Oh, my. Question yes, yeah. How much do you think the renewable portfolio standard and its application being you know, taken abroad and implemented through the California Energy Commission and the CARB, and, you know, with, without really regarding the 40% of decarbonized energy that they're receiving from this? And I wanted to get into that uh, subject, uh, which, which you bring up. We have the largest known geothermal resource area in the country around that South Sea. We have a thousand, uh, uh, we have a couple thousand megawatts that have been calculated, and we have right now an investor from Australia putting in over a billion with mineral and lithium uh, tractor. And we have the biggest development of solar going on. And it all basically went out of our area. And we have big transmission lines going up to go east and west because of where coal was going, was going. Uh, Santa Ana for nuclear plant to shut down was 2 billion, uh, I mean 2,000 uh, uh, megawatts. So the big, the big players, Berkshire Hathaway, Republic, Central Energy, San Diego, building on both sides of the border. So they're, they're using those portfolio standards to the benefits. They're using these greenhouse gas reduction funds to their benefits. But our community? Yeah, and that's what are they they're leaving us to They're leaving us to disturb the disturbed lands where they, where they put up these these big fans that go off, you know, and they start blowing that stuff all over our faces. So the offsets in our community and the community benefits that are literally should be happening in our community are not happening. We have we have we have a lot of solar farms. 
came in in the last few years. We know about SB100 just passed a couple days ago, the RTS, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about the renewable. But I didn't want to miss no, no, my no, quality no, stuff, but no, no. I want to just uh, address. So in our community, even though we have the largest renewable, the most renewable energy, uh, none of that energy stays there locally. It goes to Texas, it goes to other states. Um, the solar farms have actually uh, have actually hurt our community. Solar farms, in the sense that that they take out agriculture, where farm workers will come from Mexico to work, they take out land use production, they take out they disturb land and clearly not disturbed, cause uh, uh, soils to be uh, with bacteria, valley fever. I don't know if you're familiar with valley fever. That is common in your solar farm, especially with undisturbed land. So all these things are happening, and none of these benefits that should be allocated to our community from the local local government are not happening there because they're using it for their own pot, their own money, saving the site for their pet projects, but not giving back to where these money should really be happening. So there's a really big disconnection of, you know, where we want to be 2045, 100% renewable, yet our communities are not benefiting from this. So it, it, this is a good conversation, I think. But I just want to finish up on my air quality thing real quick, and we can get back to that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just want to talk a little bit more about our innovative project called Ivan Air. Uh, Ivan Air. You can find it at IvanAir.org. Uh, yeah. yeah. Ivan. His name Ivan. Yeah. Air.org. And you can see real time community monitors showing the air quality. A really understandable way to, to look at it, look at the data. And there, there should be more popping up throughout the state of California, some of their partners in, in, in other parts of the state. Um, this uh, network has also provided, this, like I mentioned, the schools. There's also a flag program that doing in schools. A simple, you said flag. A, a flag program. A, si a flag? A flag where simple okay. scenes in neighborhoods where the air quality is bad. Okay. They're flying, they're flying air flags depending on their quality to okay. protect kids, you know, okay. to reduce exposure. Right. So it is as minute or as simple as this, this flag and scene is creating a change in awareness in our right. community as well. So I think I'll leave it at that for their quality, well, but you know, it's, it's, it's... For you guys, you really need to look at, because you got so many key lights and stuff, you really need to look at the uh, pharmaceutical aspect, you know, the yeah. antibiotics. Right, you got to look at the bacteria, uh, beyond that. Well, the antibiotics are very really bad for us as well, and then uh, they create antibiotic resistance, so then when the kids go to the doctor, they have, they can't, uh, Let's say they have marks on Then the doctors have a real tough time handling that. And that's all because of the antibiotics. And the other thing is hormones. Again, those are very powerful substances that grow hormones so that they go to your kids and certain acts, you know, they can mature faster or they can have cancers. Or it's a very uh, difficult thing. So I would be looking for that in your area too because that's what's really impacting you big time right now. Thank you. I don't want to dismiss. Sorry, yeah. yeah, I don't want to dismiss the, the renewables are good, you know. But we would, we would, we would like to see rooftop solar in our community, yeah. Yeah, as opposed yes. to taking out land and all that, right? So, I mean, we're all for renewable energy and and clean energy. When it comes to geothermal, uh, you know, in our community, there's we, we have the largest uh, known uh, geothermal resource. Areas they call it the N K N R A. It's not so much it's not the key that I'm questioning right now. I mean, bring up some good points right. that I have to consider right now. My vote is taking on forty percent. That's still thirty. Yeah, that's it's still thirty. Within the renewables approach, exactly. You know, uh, we, we, have, so we have bio, we have incinerator, we have burning trash, we have the so the the, the bill that just passed with the. Or the diesel canyon. Now this money is going to be sent to Central Valley to create biodigesters. Yet who's going to benefit? It's the same right. industry, the same uh, uh, gas industry is the one benefiting because now they're producing energy from that way. So you spoke about the PM 2.5, which is what is being questioned now in uh, the Central Air Quality Coalition, in the sense that that's not even being regulated. It's going to be discussed within the agencies right now. Right. right. They're just looking at potential money benefit from it. Right. Consider the social and health impact. Yeah, already has on the community of the second half. 
And that's what we need to focus on. We'll be speaking tomorrow on that same issue as well, too. Hopefully, we have my cardboard uh, meetings and CEC meetings. I don't think they're really representing the disadvantaged communities that the RPS is having to be used to. Them too. So on, on, Septem on the September 27th, there's going to be a card meeting uh, uh, around community nomination. Who we'll gets selected so they can implement the strategy to reduce emissions in, in communities? There's only 10 communities being selected throughout California. So this is going to be a board meeting if you, know, you want to attend there. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not for the government, but I'm just saying you know, that's our, our, this is our opportunity to voice our concerns because you know this plan comes with reduced emissions. So we, wanna, we have to promote the, the agency, the local air district, and CARP, and be the, the mediator between them because if we let just the air district work with the community, we ain't going to get anywhere. That's so right. We need to work with CARP and, and all of those. And the California Energy Commission just went ahead and voted into their meetings the Coalition for Disadvantaged. Uh, people who participate within the project. They don't have the voting right. They have only the ability to sit there and read. I looked on the selection of these board, and not one of these people come from those disaffected or infected disaffected areas right. that are being impacted. Exactly. Now, I'm pretty much sure that you've been selected not on point figures, but like you said, I think that idea that way over in the California Engineering Commission, they're talking about doing more pollution and more suffering between the impacts. And that, I think, is where my interest was. I want to close with one topic, and then we'll do Q and A, and then we'll be quick. So, what's going to happen with that seat? We're just going to let it dry and blow that stuff all over our faces. So we need to. They did. They wanted to do a smaller, sustainable seat. Do a ring around it. Do some cleaning, and, and then there was a request for information to maybe bring water from the sea up through Mexico and dump it into there, cleaning it up on the route, on route, resaling it on route, using it for other development on both sides of the border. And there was 11 companies that spoke up. And Natural Resources Agency just limited it to three. So there's three that want to, to see Maybe bringing water from the Sea of Cortez in there to raise the elevation back up because as much as, as it's coming in right now is evaporating. And it's starting to recede very fast, very fast. Because the 47,000 acre feet that stopped in December of, of last year is very noticeable now. Um, you can see the, the, the lines are starting. So, so, so they're saying from the Sea of Cortez that they want to pump water into the salts yeah. to make up make the difference. Yeah. And so that, that idea is, is, is starting to pick up some some interest and starting to pick up some some steam. But who's gonna pay for that one? Somebody's gonna have to pay for it. Somebody's gonna have to talk about those ranchers. Well, they, they don't even want to hear it. <laughs> they don't even want to hear it. But they would like to have you know, the $285 an acre foot, they have some on-farm efficiency, drip irrigation, sprinkler systems, pump back, pump back systems, reservoirs, canal hanging, they're getting all money for all of that. Any more questions? One question back there? Go ahead. What was the name of the ABC 17. ABC 17. And that passed when? That passed last year, 2017. Victor? Uh, uh, yeah, so I um, have two. Uh, so the first one was just like, uh, Cooper, two, right? um, you mentioned like there's an incinerator. What was it? Uh, you, did you say like there's an incinerator also in Imperial? In Imperial? No, so most recently there was a wall back and they used to be one. There's not one now, but I know they're putting a, a new form of uh, cane, sugar cane burning. Process. Uh, ethanol. Yeah. yeah, so you know, yeah, so they say it's really clean, but you know what? It's not always, you know, it, and it, we see it happening everywhere, you know. I mean, we can't come to our community and tell us this is clean when there's a, a stack and it's showing a different thing, right? Um, geothermal in our community, we have over 14 facilities. 
you know, as an organization, we're concerned about the hazardous waste that it creates. The methods they use to extract, to break the bedrock are similar to oil and gas. Yeah, there's not enough research because they use chemicals also to break through the bedrock and extract that. Just even though it's just heat, just they need to use oil uh, chemicals to cut through those through those through the bedrock. So it, it's it's a lot. You know, in a nutshell, you know how you know, but there's not a lot of research. We just say geothermal is clean, but when you're using all these other stuff to break into it and the hazardous waste that it produces when it's coming through the steam through the pipe, and they got to discharge that waste at a, at a, at a landfill. You know, these are our concerns in our community as well. But, yeah? Yeah, I have two questions. Uh, yeah, this one more, sorry. Um, uh, this, I think we're regarding the energy, like solar or renewable energy, and how it, how it seems like all the, like more, the more like mass development of like renewable energy in the valley, how it's sort of almost like extracted away from communities. Um, I was just kind of like wondering, like, um, like what are some of the like obstacles that kind of makes it so that those sort of developments cannot? The I, Imperial Valley and Imperial Irrigation District is the water right. and power king. They control the water and the power. And they're their own, what they call, balancing authority and power for that area. So they only need. 500 megawatts of power to run. And in the summer, everybody runs their air conditioners, and every summer we break records, 1,070 or something like that. And guess who pays double power this year? does. The dispatch. Because the rich farmers are putting in their own solar. They're putting the battery storage in their solar systems. So and they're being subsidized. And they're being subsidized. Yes, they're being subsidized. Yeah. Because they're the first ones who took the money for the right, right. for the uh, rebate. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to the Trans America pipeline that empties right into our power company too. We have the Trans America pipeline. We have three power generators that run on natural gas and we cool off with, with our canal water recharging mechanism in the earth. But that's been going on for almost a hundred years. And they say that, you know, it's cheaper than geothermal, even though we're sitting on the largest geothermal resource. And they didn't need the solar, so they didn't even get into the game until recently, our power yeah. company. They wanted yeah, they But they got stepped over and run over. Even from Boston, Massachusetts, uh, uh, Kennedy came into our community and, and let them you know, 80 million, 90 million dollars, and got 18 miles of that, and gets four million dollars a year that he has to put back into the disadvantaged community. Even he got it. And our local power company didn't do anything for us, but yet he went, oh, well, I'll give you guys a, a free solar panels, you know, for disadvantaged communities. Um, exactly. They helped build a 60 megawatt plant, and they're getting 30, and I don't know who they're selling the other 32. You know, for whatever it is that solar is at, I don't know if anybody knows if it's a three cents or. Five cents. We pay eight. One last question. Okay, so a couple things, but with these big solar arrays, I mean, because I've flown over a couple of them, and it's just like amazing how bright they are. And I just wonder, doesn't that create a lot of heat down there also? And is that an effect that we have to it's, think about? And it's been known. Yeah. So that, you know, it's been known, been known to cause that, it's been known to. Trick birds, even if you fry it in air, or birds fly right into that. So, you know, there are environmental impacts of, of big solar voltaic projects. And some of these also, to start up, they use natural gas. So it's not enough, and some of these are not really, it's, it's difficult to assess which are the best. I mean, rooftop would be the best way to go, I think, right? But yet it's still not affordable to many homeowners. Now, what I think it's, um, I forget which is. And it is with one in the San Bernardino Mountains that uses a startup with natural gas. And I know I talked to one of my colleagues who works a lot of on campus trade, and I told you to look into it. Let me know more about that because it's, you know, we want to sell, we say clean, but we still have natural gas, so you know, it's not entirely clean. So, do, are they doing environmental reviews of these projects and, and the, the related effects of the Dust not very good. Not good. They're rubber stepping everything because it's jobs. They are doing, by the RPS, they are scheduled as an integrated 
resource statement or something of that nature, but only for businesses that generate more than 700 megawatts. Yeah. So while biomass and incineration and a few of the others aren't being monitored or so, so the so the geothermals, if you don't go over 49 megawatts, you need a you don't need a right. to communicate to CC. You're with this county. Right. So what does that happen? Right? That's right. there is exactly from it. So whole community is being polluted. Yeah. There's, 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 there's exemption from water, there's exemption from air permits. So all this is still an impact. So the general manager at one of our meetings looked at me and said, Mr. Hernandez, I'm not going to sit here and let you say that the, the geothermals are polluting our community. But they need to do this. And I go, oh, they need to do CEQA reviews. CEQA reviews, yes. Yeah, no, they do blanket permits. If you want to build 12 for geothermals, they get one permit. That's what they've been doing. We had one operator for 10 years without a permit. Well, you guys can get this <laughs> Yeah, we work on a lot of that stuff. You know, we have so much on our plate. You know, <laughs> we're the only organization in, in that region, but we but we also do a lot of work statewide. But uh, and look into the California Environmental Justice Coalition. We're the webpage. We're part of that coalition. So stop. Unless there's any more questions, we'll have.